I'm excited this afternoon to be here. Uh, this month, the theme for the church has been fruitfulness, is fruitfulness, and four pastors have actually taught us both on the physical and the spiritual aspect of fruitfulness, and indeed we have been richly blessed by their ministration. So this morning, I will also be teaching on an aspect of fruitfulness. And the topic of my sermon is, what is your love language for God? <laughs> Hallelujah. If you are sitting next to somebody, can you just whisper to them and ask them, what is your love language for God? L let us pray. Uh, Father, this morning I submit myself to the leading and the totality of the Holy Spirit, I ask that you take absolute control. We take control of this environment. We come against distractions, O oh God. We pray this afternoon that the word of God will have free course in the heart of your people, that as the word will challenge us, it will also embolden us, it will strengthen us, it will direct us, it will guide us, O oh, oh Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus. Uh, Father, that at the end of the day, the glory shall be yours, but the blessings shall be for your people. And therefore, I pray, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Somebody say, Amen. Amen. So I start with this, that the Christian walk is not an easy walk. The Christian walk is not a stroll in the park. It requires discipline, it requires diligence, it requires endurance, focus, and determination in order to show love and to be fruitful consistently. Somebody say consistently. See, because you can show love and you can be fruitful for a season, but if you want to be consistent, you have to be diligent. You have to endure, you have to be focused and you have to be determined about that. When we look at the lives of the early apostles, you will understand what I'm talking about. Uh, for example, Stephen was stoned to death in ministry. And even as he was being killed, he said, God forgive them for they know not what they're doing. St. Peter was crucified upside down. But today, when you teach people, someone's like, endure hardship as a good soldier of Christ, it doesn't resonate very well with them. Uh, they, they don't want to hear that. They rather hear the power of the seed. And they'll say, Pastor, take me to Genesis chapter 26, verse 12, where the Bible says that Isaac sowed in the land when there was a famine and he had hundredfold. And if I say somebody shout amen, the amen will be thunderous because the church today is focused on receiving rather than giving. The church today is focused more on the flesh rather than the things of the spirit. And so that's why this morning I'm going to challenge us and ask you, what is your love language for God? Let me start and lay some foundation because before we get into that particular topic. I believe that based on the word of God, that our relationship with God is a partnership. Somebody say partnership. And that partnership is based on God's love for us. And God also expects us to reciprocate that love to him. And why do I say that? Well, when I look at 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 1, the Bible says, We then as workers together with him also plead with you not to receive the grace of God in vain. In fact, when you look at the New Living Translation for that particular scripture, it says, We as God's partners, that we are God's partners, and we beg you not to accept this marvelous gift of God's kindness and to ignore it. If you look at Corinthians and we move back and we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 9, it says, for we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, you are God's building. According to the grace of God, which was given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another builds on it. 
But he then warns us, it admonishes us, says, let each one of you take heed on how he builds on it because he, he, it, it understands and extends this concept of partnership. And Paul said, I planted, Apollos did what? Apollos watered, and who brought the increase? God brought the increase. So with, between Paul and Apollos and God, there was increase. And some of the scriptures that we've looked uh, in the past uh, few weeks, John 15, 1 to 8, we don't have to go through everything. Let me just quickly run through it. He says, I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And then every branch in the, me that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. And then he says something very important in verse 4. He says, Abide in me and I in you. Again, that's a partnership. Uh, and as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. He says, I am the vine and you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me, you can do nothing. So even in that partnership, we realize that God is the primary source, but it's still a partnership because it emphasizes that without me, you can do nothing. So I know some of you are very cerebral and you're saying, Pastor, why does the almighty God need us in partnership to win souls? And saints, it's a mystery. It's a mystery because when we start the Bible in Genesis chapter 1, the Bible says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And saints, God did not need anybody to create the heavens and the earth. In fact, the Bible told, tells us that everything that God created was what? Was good. He separated the waters. It was good. But when it comes to winning souls and expanding the kingdom, there's a great commission. It says, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things. Somebody say all things. I, 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 I emphasize all things because I know that some people are predisposed only to the good things of the kingdom. And then when we were having the workers development and brother uh, Pat was, uh, brother Richard was teaching us, he, he mentioned the, the requirements that it's not just the good side, it's also the bad, the, the, the challenges. And of course, I've shown you that the early apostles, they suffered a lot for ministry. So the things that Christ had to suffer for us. So when you are going through challenges, it's not necessarily your, the demons. It's not necessarily the enemy. It, it's not even your village people. Amen. Say amen, somebody. There are things that you have to suffer, suffer to mature, and the Lord will grant us understanding in the mighty name of Jesus. So now I've established that there's a partnership. <clears throat> and so the question you might want to ask is, Pastor, what is the foundation for this partnership? And of course, as many of the pastors have taught us over the past few weeks, the foundation or the basis for this partnership is love. Because John 3.16, which we should all know, says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever, whosoever believes in him should not perish, but should have everlasting life. And John 14, 15 says, if you love me, you will do what? You will obey my commandments. So what God is saying, what the scripture is emphasizing is that it's not a one-way love. It's a two-way love. It's dual love. God loves us and God expects in the partnership as we work together with him uh, as workers in the vineyard for us to also demonstrate that love. In fact, what the scripture is saying, if I may say that, is that your obedience to God's word is the proof of your love. Let me repeat that. Your obedience to God's words, to the scripture, is the proof of your love. In other words, it's not just what you say that counts, but what you do that matters to God. And that's why the Bible admonishes us in James 1, 22, 
James 1, 22. It says, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, uh, deceiving yourselves. Uh, and there's a lot of self-deception among Christians. Um, but that's why the Bible says, by their fruit, you shall do what? You shall know them. Now, let me, let me break this down a bit. In, in, in some relationships, that is when we were younger and we were maybe dating or, you know, in courtship, usually you don't want to say I love you very quickly. Is that not correct? Because maybe you're dating this just like I was dating my beautiful wife. I, I was feeling her, but I didn't want to say, honey, I, I love you. I, I, I wanted to, you know, to know, make sure that I really appreciate and uh, the feeling was not superficial. And of course, you can't be dating somebody for two days and you say, I love you. you say, what, what kind of love is that? You don't, even, you don't even know me. You don't know me, so you can't tell me. So many of us were very cautious to say, I love you, but... When you look at the relationship we have with God, we don't have to worry about that. Do you know 1 John 4, 19 says, we love him because he first the word. He first loved. So even before you enter the partnership, you know that God loves you. In fact, Romans 5, 8 says, but God demonstrated his love to us in that while we were yet sinners, he did what? He died for us. So now you are coming into a partnership where you don't have to doubt the love of God. Because he said, even before you come into this relationship, I've already loved you with an everlasting love. So it's not as if you're just trying to be cool and say, even though I'm feeling this girl, I'm, I'm, I'm going to take my time. And before I say I love you, no, no. With God, once you enter the relationship, you know that he, he loves you. And of course, God expects us as believers to demonstrate our love towards him. Uh, when they were asking Jesus about, you know, the, what are the important things the, uh, in the law that we must uh, practice or we must follow. In Matthew 22, 36 to 40, it says, You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And in verse 38, it says, This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second equally important law is that you must love the Lord. You must love your neighbor as yourself. So let me just add this to this, to the, to the teaching. With every partnership comes responsibility. Somebody say responsibility. Even if the partnership is based on love. With every partnership comes responsibility. You know, some folks, guys, they have this they belong to this school of thought that because we are saved by grace through faith, which I subscribe to, that we have no responsibilities because grace covers everything. But I, I disagree with that school of thought. I believe that as Christians, of course, we are saved by grace, but we have responsibilities in this partnership. So I can't just sit back and say, I'm just trusting God. No, my perspective, my, my attitude to everything in life is that I'm doing my best and trusting God for the rest. Say amen, somebody. So you must always have this attitude, whether in service, whether it's in demonstrating love in whatever you do, that you always do your best and you trust God for the rest. Uh, you know, when you, are in, when you have been married, you know that even though marriage starts based on love, but marriage comes with responsibilities. Say amen. If you are, where the married folks are, if you've been married for more than a few weeks, you know that uh, marriage comes with responsibilities. Uh, uh, even the honeymoon that lasts for maybe a couple of weeks, even during honeymoon, there, there are responsibilities, but we'll not discuss that. <laughs> amen. Say amen, somebody. You know, there are two aspects of love. There's love that can be described as a noun. And let me explain. And there's love that can also be described as a verb. So when love is described as a noun, it can be like, oh, I love ice cream. Perhaps in particular, I love hugging does or something. That's a noun because there's no, there's, you don't have to do anything. There's no, there's no responsibility except for paying for the ice cream when you go to the store. Or maybe like some of our, our members in this church, you can say, I love football. You know, we call them... Uh, armchair quarterbacks or armchair coaches they can analyze a football game or basketball game but when it comes to agape love love in agape is actually a verb 
It is the love that requires action. Someone say action. You know, the only love that doesn't require action is social media love. Hello? <laughs> you know, when you, you see something, perhaps as an example on Facebook, and you, you know, you, you can, it, all it requires is an emoji. You can just put the love there. So there was this particular chap. He had over 5,000 friends on Facebook. And he sent invitation to, because about only 1,000 of them live in the same state, so he sent a wedding invitation to a thousand of his five thousand friends, and then on the day of his wedding, guess how many people showed up? Only five of them, because saints, he said, social media love does not require any action, it does not require any commitment, it does not require any sacrifice. The only thing you have to do is to do what? Just press the emoji and say, "Oh, I love what you're doing. I love your wedding pictures." So, but. Again, I have this pastor friend sometime last year. He, he, he was actually a very good cause. He wanted to raise money for cancer. So he said, I'm going to take one million steps in 50 days, which means an average of 20 steps every day. And this guy, I mean, I've known him since college, and he also has about 4,000 friends. And so he started. So every day, of course, you know, to walk 20,000 steps consistently every day means that you're working three, four hours or something like that. So every day he would work and he would post his progress on, on Facebook and he was expecting because he had 4,000 friends that this 1,000 pounds would be just easy peasy, right? So day one, day two, week one, week two. And then since after four weeks, he had only raised 175 pounds from 4,000 friends. So you can see that the love that you expect on social media is a love that doesn't have any sacrifice or any commitment. And the reason I bring that kind of love is that I've observed in ministry that there are some Christians that actually have a relationship with God that is kind of a social media love. You know, they, anything that is inconvenient, they don't want to be part of it. Anything that involves sacrifice or commitment to God, they don't want to do anything like that. They want to serve God from a place of convenience. They want to serve God and make up their rules. But saints, I've come to announce to you that, you know, when you want to serve God, you have to be diligent with it. You have to serve God with excellence. You have to serve God and give it everything that you have. Uh, if I go into the, the, the five love languages and I break down maybe three or four of them, and then I will challenge each one of us as how we can use these five love languages to serve God. The five love languages are, you know, words of affirmation, you know, acts of service, receiving gifts, quality time, and physical touch. And if you are married and you haven't read that book, it's by Gary Chapman. It was published in 1992. And I would encourage you greatly, you know, to read that book and to find out what is the love language of your partner uh, so that from my perspective, because I've actually read the book and I, my wife has read the book, uh, it helps us to identify uh, each other's love language and to help strengthen our marriage. It makes our marriage to be more fruitful. You know, my, my love language is actually acts of service. So if I, in the house, I just vacuum the house, I help in the kitchen, I clean up the house and all that, I might think that that's something that my wife appreciates, and she does. But her primary love language is not acts of service. It's receiving gifts. And I don't know whether this is to do with <laughs> Hallelujah, somebody. <laughs> I don't know whether this is to do with the way women are wired, but, you know, uh, many women like to receive gifts. In fact, <laughs> last week Sunday, by the grace of God, we, we celebrated our 34th wedding anniversary. Hallelujah. And, um, you know, we, we got home and my wife, you know, she was she said, man of God, you know, do you think it's easy to live with you for 34 years? I said, I said no, only by the grace of God. So now she said, well, I was expecting, I was expecting some flowers this morning. I was expecting some chocolate. I'm expecting some gifts because, you know, I've lived with you for 34 years and we have children and grandchildren. And I, I you know, so I said, honey, I'm, I'm sorry. She said, don't worry. Anyway, I have the, the joint account. I'm going to take care of myself. <laughs> so, so for me, it was like, you know, 
it's a different life. So I'm, you, you can tell after 34 years I'm still learning, so you can, you can laugh at me, but you know, that, that's just the way it is. And so if you want your marriage to be fruitful, if you want it to be successful, you know, you, you have to learn your partner's primary love language. Because there was a seminar we had, and one brother got up and said, uh, to the teacher, I said, I, I think I can, I, I can relate to all five love languages. I said, hold on, brother. The idea behind this is to have a primary love language and then perhaps a secondary, but you know, don't kill your partner and tell them you have all these five love languages and you expect them to satisfy you. So please, when, when you read that, you have to take the time. Uh, I will expect that maybe the Almighty God will, will show you you know, your primary love language, and then you can use that. So you might say, hold on, pastor, that's fine. You know, people have love languages. Couples have love languages. What makes you think that God has love languages? And that's, that's, that's a, it's a reasonable question. You know, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, Genesis 1, 27, the Bible says, so God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, God created them, male and female, he created them. I don't know whether you've heard this adage that says, the apple does not fall far from where? The tree. You see, a lion can only give birth to what? A lion. A lion cannot give birth to a dog. In my language, in my local language, it says, epun lekumbi. A lion cannot give birth to a dog. So if we are created in God's image, uh, which means we have God's DNA, which means we have God's trait, which means we are, and the Bible tells us in different places that we're children of God. You know, some of you, uh, especially those of you that have multiple children, uh, perhaps one or two of them, you say, wow, this boy or this girl looks very much like me and because you you see your traits in him or in her and I hope like you know some people do that is not your favorite child because the Bible says all our children are taught of the Lord and grace shall be there. It says we are fearfully and wonderfully made but when you have children you can't help but notice that some of them have your traits so much they, they share what you like they behave the way you like and God help you you know, some of the negative things that you used to do, you also see them doing it. So it stands to reason, because we are created in God's image, that if we've identified, especially when I'm talking about partnership based on love, and marriage is an example of that, that if we have love languages, that God also has a love, love, in fact, I believe, that God has multiple love languages. And as we go into them, I'll share with you. So the first one I want to look at is uh, receiving gifts. Let me ask you this. What's the greatest gift that you can give anybody? Is it money? No, it's not money. It's, it's your life. It's your life. That's the greatest gift that you can give anybody is to say, well, I'm willing to die for you. I'm willing to give my life for you. You know, the Bible says that while we were yet sinners, Christ did what? He died for us. That was a gift that he gave us. You know, in Ephesians 5, when Paul was saying, just as Christ loved the church, he gave up his life for her to make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing of God's word, husbands love your wives. You know, when we do marriage ceremonies, I, I notice that husbands, uh, traditionally, they, they like the style where they say, wives, obey your husband. But when we now begin to also, because you have to teach the totality of the word, we say, you know, the husbands should love their wives. They like it. Just, but when we add just as Christ loved the church, a lot of them say, hold on, pastor. <laughs> Come on, pastor. I mean, you know, Christ died for the Church, I'm not sure I'm ready to die for this woman yet. <laughs> but that is what the Bible is saying. You know, I've been in ministry for over 20 years, and I've never seen any husband that is willing to die for their wife. In fact, if, if the, um, and we've seen that, if there's a situation where, you know, perhaps one spouse passes, maybe the wife passed, there was a pastor we had several years ago in a different ministry, the wife passed, 
you know, if or if theoretically they, they say, well, are you willing not only to give a kidney, but to give your life for your wife? You know, some of them might say, Pastor, didn't you read that Jesus died at the age of 33 and he fulfilled his ministry? Methuselah died at the age of 969 and he only begat Noah. So it's not the number of years that counts, it's the life. You know, people can be very, they become philosophers very quickly. <laughs> it's the life in the years. How do you know that the, the spouse hasn't finished or fulfilled her ministry? Now, you know, we've tried all, God knows, God knows best. And therefore, they, they, they are very reluctant uh, to sacrifice anything that is that significant for their partner. But God did it for us. Uh, to top it all, most men will remarry within a few years of losing their wives, even pastors and apostles. Uh, you know, there was a case here where a pastor's wife, I mean, was, uh, you know, she had kidney issues, and unfortunately, she, she declined very quickly, and she passed. And then within six months, the pastor already, you know, he remarried, and they said, Pastor, but, you know, at least you should grieve for a year or two. So the man of God said, Show me in the Bible where it says that the man of God must wait for one year before he remarries. He said, there's nowhere that he says, as the spirit leads, that's what he's doing. So don't, God will help us in Jesus' name. But the thing I want to just take out of this is that whichever way you express your love for God, it must be with excellence. Uh, it must be, because the Bible says, for the Lord loves the world, a cheerful giver. You know, I've observed that some people, when, to, when they want to buy things for themselves, uh, they, they buy the best. They don't compromise. But when it comes to giving God, giving the work of God, they want to give the absolute minimum. And uh, allow me to expand on that. So we have people that, you know, they buy beautiful houses. And it's good. They buy luxury cars. They buy all these wonderful bags, maybe Christian Louboutin, Louis Vuitton, Gucci, and all that. But when it comes to giving to God, how many of you know Goodwill shops? Second, you know, you know, second-hand or thrift shops? They, their attitude is like they want to give God a second-hand. What do I mean by that? So they can spend two, three, four thousand on a bag, but when it comes to giving God, they think that giving God $50 is, is a big deal. And then they scratch their head, they try to justify but when they are spending on themselves, they don't care. They can spend, and you know, good things are good. Live a good life. But hey, since I, I, I've come to announce to you that God is not a beggar. The same attitude that you have towards yourself, when I talk about the love language, God loves receiving gifts. The Bible says God loves a cheerful giver. So if you are going to spoil yourself, how come you think it's right that you give God second hand? You give God the absolute minimum. But when you want to help, when you want to treat yourself, you give yourself the best. I don't have a problem with you giving yourself the best. You deserve it. But saints, you have to understand from God's perspective that God knows everything about you. And the Holy Spirit will give you revelation in Jesus' name. You know, if you are going to give God something, give him the same attitude that you give your children or you give your partner. You know, when you have a ministry where you have to cajole people, you have to announce, you have to do this all the time just to support the work. Check your heart because it shows clearly because when it's a personal item, you don't compromise. But when it's something of God, then you say, well, I can give $75, but you just bought a bag for $3,000. You just bought belt and you, got, and you live in a house for $600,000. Glory be to God. But God expects you to reciprocate the love that you have for yourself, the love you have for your family, the things that you are willing to spend on yourself, he expects you to do the same for him. And God is, 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 is not fooled because he knows how much we are worth. And I think it's very sad that, you know, some Christians don't understand spiritual principles because your expression of giving to God is for your benefit as God does not need your gift to be God Almighty. He says, I'm God, is God all by himself? Does God need your, whether you give to God or you don't, will that stop the almightiness of God? No. It just shows that you don't understand spiritual principles. That's what it shows. You are immature. You feel that you are much more important in this partnership than God. 
So anytime you're supposed to give towards the work of God, you want to give the absolute minimum. But every anytime you want to treat yourself, then so today I challenge you, the same way you want to treat yourself, you should also be extend the same love to God. Because believe it or not, without God, you won't be where you are today. The Lord will give you understanding in Jesus' mighty name. You know, Proverbs eleven twenty four. it says, There's one who scatters, yet increases more. And there's one who withholds more than is right, but that leads to poverty. The general soul will be made rich, and he who waters will be watered himself. You know, even when King Solomon, uh, he, he made an offering, an unusual offering to God. He gave a thousand burnt offerings. The Bible says, God had to ask him, what do you want? Because it was unusual that this man understands spiritual principle. First Kings, we can't go into that because of the time. The Bible says in First Kings 3, it says, Solomon loved the Lord. If I ask you, I'm sure all of you will raise up your hand this afternoon. I say, we love the Lord. And then he followed all the decrees of his father, David. And in verse 5, he, 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 in verse 4, he said, at Gibeon, Solomon offered, sacrificed a thousand burnt offerings. And that night, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream. And God said, what do you want? Ask, and I will give it to you. I'm not surprised, though, because the Bible says that the love of many will grow cold. And that's what we see in today's contemporary Christians. Even if your friend invites you to a wedding, I've seen this, and you don't know the bride and groom very well. Do you know some people will still buy expensive ashebi? Just because they want to be part of the wedding. But when we say, come and support the work of God, then that's when excuses will come. You know, indifference with God will always find an excuse. But love will find a way. Let me repeat that. Indifference, you know you're indifferent to the things of God when you make excuses for everything. Oh, I've spent all my money. How much do I have left? Let me give God $50. But you're planning to go on a trip and you're going to spend $3,000. And that $50, you're not even given willingly. It's as if grudgingly. May the Lord give us understanding concerning, regarding gifts to kingdom things in Jesus' mighty name. Saints, the Lord loves a cheerful, voluntary giver. Nobody needs to cajole you. If you understand how important God is in your life, you know, if you understand the relationship, I told you this is a partnership. It says we are God's partners. We are God's fellow builders. We are God's fellow workers. So how are you building this partnership? And in this partnership, it's not one way. It's both ways. As God demonstrated his love, he died for you and for me. We need to be better. You know, when we, in the next one, so we've talked about gifts. Let me quickly rush through. Then let's talk about quality time. God loves it when we spend quality time with him. And I'm not talking about just showing up in church for two hours on Sunday, and that's your quality time. If you're married and the only time you spend with your spouse is two hours every week, then you know that that marriage is in what? It's in trouble, you know? And why is it important that quality time, in my opinion, is about spending time to study the word of God so you understand God. Spending time to know the heart of God. You can live with somebody and not know them. You can live with somebody for years. You can be married to somebody. You don't spend time with them. You don't really know them. Do you know that some Christians, they quote their pastors more than they quote the word of God? Oh, Pastor Adeboye said this. Praise the Lord. It must be true. John Hagee said this. It must be true. T.D. Jake said this. It must... How come you are quoting men more than God? And then what happens, because these men are not perfect, now they hold on to a doctrine and you begin to follow that doctrine. Let me give you an example. The doctrine of first fruit. Some, some churches, they say first fruit, you must, you must give first fruit. Now they become confused. Some say first fruit is first week salary. Some will tell you it's the whole of January salary. Hello? I say Papa has said it, it must be so. But the Bible says Jesus Christ is our what? Is our first fruit. If you don't spend time in studying the word, you'll be flowing to and fro with doctrines. 
You have a responsibility in this partnership. Study to show yourself approved unto God. Be diligent to present yourself approved unto God. Don't be quoting your pastor more than the Bible because your pastor himself, when he's wrong, then you, you quickly reverse yourself. Ephesians 4.14 says that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by trickery of men in cunning craftiness and deceitful plotting. If you, and then also this is why it's very dangerous not to know the Bible. If you don't know the Bible, guess what? You will go with something that resonates with your flesh. Oh, that sounds, that sounds good. What, what pastor said is good. <laughs> but do you know what Romans 8, 7? It says, for the sinful nature of man is always hostile to God. Which means if you don't know God, you only accept things that are convenient for you. you only, oh, that sounds good. Yeah, that sounds good because it's convenient for you. It's not doesn't require any commitment from you. It doesn't require any sacrifice from you. So, of course, your flesh says it sounds good, but it might not be of God. Saints, I challenge you. What God is saying is the most important, not what any man is saying, because all men are men of God, and they are, they are not perfect. Nobody, if anybody says, there was a guy that says, Pastor, I'm looking for a perfect church. So the pastor warned him, if you find that church, don't join it because you'll spoil it. You yourself, you are not perfect. Hallelujah. So when it comes to quality time, how much time do you spend with God? Is it only when you're in church you spend time? Do you spend time to share the Bible with your family? And for men in particular, are you the priest in your home or your wife is always chasing you? The Lord will help you in Jesus' mighty name. Let me go to acts of service. I might stop here because of my time. What are the acts of service that we perform for God? You know, when I read the story of Daniel, I'm always very intrigued. Because Daniel lived in captivity. He refused to settle for mediocrity. And that brought him to the attention of not one, not two, not three, not four, but five kings from different tribes. There was a spirit of excellence found in Daniel that they were not able to resist him. Do you know in church, people have this, uh, everything is okay, attitude. I've noticed that in the church, everything is okay. I'm a worker in the church, but if I don't come for workers development, it is what? It's okay. I'm a member of the church, but if I only attend one Sunday in a month, it's what? It's okay. The other three Sundays, I'm on my bed, playing with Facebook, watching Pastor Steve teach, and then, it's okay. Uh, is it not okay? That's, that, that attitude, it sucks. It sucks. Because it's like you are belittling God. What reputation do you have among the brethren? They told Daniel, I've heard that you have the spirit of the gods within you. And that you are filled with insight, understanding, and you're filled with wisdom. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes 9.10, it says, whatsoever your hands find to do, do it well. Do it well. Let me, let me just ask you. You know, because they say out of sight is out of mind, but that does not apply to God. Because first of all, he's the omniscient God, he's the all-knowing God. Secondly, is the omnipresent God. If God was going to grade your act of service that you do for him, I'm not talking about for a church, but what you do for him personally, one to ten, do you think you'll pass? Or because you are saved by grace through faith, you don't have to do anything. Everything is what? Is okay. may, may God deliver us from mediocre spirit concerning things of the kingdom. Everything is okay, spirit. Come and give to the work of God. Everything is okay. Fifty dollars. But I will buy a bag of 3000 tomorrow. Everything is okay. Do you not see a man who excels in his work? Proverbs tells us, he will stand before kings and not before unknown men. And since the, you know, the, 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 the lesson about life is that 
If you are waiting for the big event to demonstrate excellence, you might never move beyond your current state. It's not a cause. You know, David's first fight was not against Goliath. You know, many of us, we love the story of David. David killed Goliath. When David was given the responsibility, someone said responsibility, responsibility of looking after the sheep, he was diligent. The Bible says the bear came, the lion came, and David defended his territory. Whatsoever you have been, has been placed in your hand as duty, it can be in your home for God, simply to lead your family. And you are neglecting that. You are showing God that you're not serious about him. Because one of the love languages of God is how well are you doing in this role? Forget church. Let's look at your home. How well are you performing as a priest in your home? How well are you do, performing as the head, as the wife, as the mother in your home? Is this everything is okay? You know, people spend more time on Facebook than studying the world. They spend more time on social media. For some of them, gisting is what we know them for. They say, what do you know? What do the brethren know you for? They say, oh, Fofo is my hobby. <laughs> that will not be your portion in Jesus' name. Excellence requires two things, extra time and extra effort. That, that's the truth. Do you spend extra time and extra effort concerning the things of God? If you are to go shopping, you know nobody will be looking for you. You don't mind extra time and effort. The things that satisfy the flesh. But when it comes to the things of God, pastor, and we are 10 minutes late, say, why are you people 10 minutes late now? On Sunday, don't you know how to go and eat? But when you go to a shop where there's sales and you, and you plan to go there for 30 minutes, you can be there six hours and, and your flesh is not, is not uh, irritating you. But when it comes to things of the kingdom, a little inconvenience and people flare up. What are you people doing in this church anyway? The Lord will give us understanding. Saints, if there's anything you remember from this, only when you have done your best can you expect God to do the rest? Only when you have done your best in this relationship, in this partnership. Because many people act as if they're asking, they're working for the pastor. They act as if the responsibility they have is for the head of department. And that is not true. May the Almighty give us desire for excellence in all our endeavors. You know, when you have excellence in your workplace, it should extend to the home. And it should extend to the ministry. Is that not correct? Yes. Words of affirmation. You know, words of affirmation will confirm, it will support, it will empathize, it will uplift. When the psalmist says, I will bless the Lord at all times, and his praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make its boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear of it and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I told you, Genesis 1:27, that we are created in God's image. In my culture, the Yoruba culture, there's something they call oriki. <laughs> when they begin, it's, it's like praise poetry. When they begin to affirm you and they call you oriki, even the, especially if you go to God help us, if you still go to Owambe party, if they start, you know, praising you, even the money you didn't plan to spend, you will spend it. When you, you begin to affirm God, God, without you, I can do nothing. You are the ancient of days. You are the hope of my life. You are the bread of life. You are the lion of the tribe. God will say, hold on, hold on, my daughter. How can I, how can I help you? You are affirming God, especially in, in difficult circumstances. I choose not to look at the circumstances. I choose to look at Jehovah. They were teaching us, leading us. What God cannot solve does not what? Exist. When you are firm, if, if, if you go in the presence of a king and you begin to you know, praise the king, that king is obligated to say, listen, okay, how can I help you? If you affirm God, you praise God, and you are living right, 
God will respond from the heavens concerning your case in Jesus' mighty name. Make it a habit to offer words of affirmation. You know, when you are married and you, are, you should be your, your spouse's greatest cheerleader. You know, imagine if I tell my wife, and it's true, if I was going to choose again, I would choose you. Say, ah, honey, yeah, I, I like the sound of that. And my wife tells me sometimes, I don't know whether she's joking, say, you are the best husband in the world. I say, hallelujah. I say, honey, what do you want? <laughs> Finally, physical touch. Physical touch talks about intimate relationship with God. Uh, you know, Christians have mastered the act of acting, the, the art of acting. We, we, we know how to put on masks. So I can ask a brother, how are you? I'm blessed and highly favored of the Lord. But he still argued with his wife to the car park. Still dealing with issues of pornography. Still dealing with temper, with envy, with things. And then we, we put on this mask. We, we're not vulnerable. We are not even vulnerable before God. Because we are used to the mask. The Bible says David was a man after God's own heart. He had a, a close, intimate relationship with God. If I ask you, do you have an intimate relationship with God? Talking about physical touch. Or even when you pray, do you just hurry? Intimacy is defined as close familiarity, close friendship. Are you vulnerable with God? Can you bear your weaknesses and fears before the Almighty God? God is the starting place for intimacy. And the sense, of course, before you say it, he knows it. Do your actions touch the heart of God? Brethren, I conclude with 2 Corinthians 5.14. It says, for the love of Christ compels us. The love of Christ motivates us. It's not Pastor Steve that motivates you. It's not Pastor Ola that motivates you, Pastor Shea or myself or Pastor Walter or any of the other pastors. It's because you have love for Christ. See, as long as it is men that motivate you, there's no way you can go to a deep level with God. But when it is the love of Christ that motivates you, then your work, your relationship in that partner. We live for God because his love compels us to be devoted to him. Remember, indifference will find an excuse, but love will always find a way. God is not looking for perfection in us. God is looking for progress. God is looking for us to move ahead. God is looking for us to reflect and say, a few years ago I was like this, but today I'm like this. Start with your love language. You might say, Pastor, how do I start? Start, what is your love language? Start with that. And then pray, with, pray and God will show you. But saints, one thing I, I just encourage you, Make God a priority in your life. The same way you spoil yourself, you treat yourself, and you have a right to, you deserve it. We're not getting any younger. And we've worked for years, I've worked for over 30 years. So I, I deserve to look good, I deserve to, but I also must make God a priority in my life. So my attitude should not be, when it comes to think of God, things of God, it can't be everything is what? Okay. Let's close our eyes. Father, this morning, afternoon, we just want to thank you for your grace. Thank you for your love for us. Thank you that even when we didn't deserve it, even when we do not even now deserve it, you're always faithful. Thank you for your consistency. Thank you that when you choose to bless us, when you choose to reward us, you don't give us the minimum. You don't. Your attitude is always to reward us with the best that you can give us. Father, open our eyes to understand spiritual principles that men will not have to cajole us to embrace the things of the kingdom. Father, stir up our spirit to understand the importance of love and reciprocating that love which you have demonstrated to us in every life, Lord. Make us to be productive believers. Father, every excuse that we have used before, O oh Lord, 
we remove those excuses. We ask for the grace to live a consistent life with you. We ask for the grace to have excellence and diligence in our relationship with you, in this partnership that you have opened our eyes to. And Father, we ask for forgiveness the way that we have treated you in the past. Help us, Holy Spirit, help us to be discerning, help us to take, take the things of the kingdom more seriously, that we will not wait for people to motivate us, to galvanize us, that that shall come from within, Lord, in the name of Jesus. More importantly, grant us the grace to find joy in this work. Just like the joy many of us have in our personal relationship, let that passion, that zeal for the things of the kingdom come from within us, that people will not have to pursue us and call us, have you done this? It's all about you, Lord. It's all about the kingdom. It's not about man. Give us that perspective. Open our eyes, oh God. Father, we, we thank you. Thank you for being patient with us, Lord. Thank you for walking with us. It is God that had walked with us, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. We rededicate ourselves to you, Lord. Help us in this work, Lord. Help us to serve you with our being. Let the excuses stop. Let our perspective as to who you are and what you do for us, let it open our eyes to how we should respond to the things of the kingdom. It's a personal responsibility. And we receive the grace, oh God, from today to serve you at the high level that you also love us. Thank you, everlasting Father. For in Jesus' mighty name we have prayed. Amen. Amen.